Untamed. Five, four, three, two, one. The Platform. Welcome to the podcast, people. Highlights package of our show, which is aired every day live on the platform between one and four. My name is Martin Devlin. Alongside me is Lachlan War. iOS, it's only sport today. We're talking league, rugby league, and a big announcement about a brand new show that we've got for you every Monday live on the platform between three and four. Myself and Tony Kemp. You'll hear more about that in this podcast. Matt Elliott, former Warriors coach, Raiders coach, Penrith coach. His expert eye on what he thinks is going to happen this year in the NRL. As well as that, Jason Costo, Costigan, Costo's corner. He joins us every Thursday. Stick the big chin out. He picks who is going to win every match round by round. Kurt Eklund from the Blues joined us on the program today. Also introducing Finn Sermon. Young man, 20 years old, left Christchurch at 15 to go to the Phoenix Academy. Played for the All Whites last year and his team sitting top of the A-League table. All of that on the podcast. We start the show the same way every single day. Tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It's time for a sermon. Oh God, we've got to play Australia in another cricket test. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. Cricket. This time last week I said I was feeling glum about the first test versus Aussie at the Basin. I said I was deflated, pessimistic in what would happen, both at the Basin and in Christchurch. I talked about how they are just better than us at cricket. They always have been. Player for player, they kick our butt. I drew the parallel with the Wallabies playing the All Blacks and that we are the equivalent of their rugby team versus ours when we play them at cricket. Once every 10 games or so, we might win one. And what happened? We got shellacked. We got embarrassed. We lost on so many levels. We couldn't bowl them out in the first innings. We dropped more catches in that one test than we normally would in a whole summer. We couldn't bat. Even Kane Williamson ran himself out the first time in his 12-test career. We played like we fear Australia. And, of course, the players will maintain that, no, there is no mental block against them. They have to say that. But the stats say otherwise. We bottle it when we're in winning positions. We succumb in the pressure moments. We get close, and that's mostly always as close as it gets. And now for Christchurch tomorrow. So what's happened since last week to change my mind? Yes, I can grasp that forlorn thing called hope. Yes, I can change a couple of letters in the spelling and and turn pessimism into optimism on paper. Yes, I can pretend to myself that this time, this test will be different. Because why can't it be? It's sport, remember, and a week is a long time between games. We've learned our lessons. We've taken those learnings. We've learned the takings. But in the end, it's still pretty much the same bowling attack. It's still the same batting lineup, and it's still the same Australian team. And we know how they're going to play, remorseless, relentless, foot on the throat, doing anything they can to win. And that's why a week later, I'm still as pessimistic as I was then. I can't pretend. It's a base and reserve repeat. And that means a 2-0 series defeat. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. Sports. News. Headlines. Yeah, uh, fair bit. Where to start? I don't know where to start. Actually, I'll start off with some football. Won't Go on. Um, the name of Auckland's new A-League franchise is said to be announced next Thursday. An email was sent out uh, early today. Is about it Tuesday it. or Thursday? Thursday? Tuesday. 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 14th of March. It's a week away today. Okay. I did not. I said it was the 14th, which is a week today. Okay. Yeah, okay. Steady on. Um, <laughs> yeah, a release coming out this morning from the A-League saying that there is a session next week or media invited to, where the name of the team will be announced. Um, according to a New Zealand media outlet called The Herald, they understand that the Black Knights is the front runner for the name of the club. Yeah, well, was, that, was, that was about peddled about three months ago, wasn't Yeah, well, it? don't search up blackknights.com.au. Not while her or boss is watching. Any. No, don't do it on your work computer. I've fallen into that trap a couple of times now, especially when I search black caps. Um, something else comes up first. <clears throat> anyway... Uh, so that's happening next Thursday, the name of the new Auckland A-League franchise. Uh, Matilda's captain, the Australian national football team, that is, the Matildas, Sam Kerr, the slur, or the racist slur, or racist phrase that she used towards a cop in London has been revealed as a stupid white, uh, excuse my French, bastard. Yeah, that's the racial slur. 
during a dispute over a taxi fee last year. Uh, this was revealed by a, new UK, a UK newspaper, The Sun, while they've reported it. Um, not as bad as what I thought, and I'm actually kind of relieved it's, it's not as bad. You know, if it was something Indian-related or maybe Pakistani-related or something, obviously we would get... Oh, it's OK, because it's a white guy. You're allowed well, to say that, Well, that's not what I'm saying, but, I mean, fair to say it's less offensive than if it was towards... It's less offensive a for us more because minority we're group. white, and I've said before, oh, you can racially abuse, but I don't care. Yeah. But for the person at the other end of it, obviously they well, do. Yeah, okay, sure. And the other thing is, just like the Hurricanes Poa, there's a little bit of deviousness attached to this about their actions, and that she's known about this for a year and didn't tell Soccer Australia about it. Mm. And yeah, now she's trying the, to wriggle off point. on a technicality. Well, so she's guilty. But. Um, Champions League this morning. Is there any point reading this out? Not really. We already know. Man City beating Copenhagen really? in the advance. Let me do the Simon Barnett. And tell me Real won. Yeah, well, they drew technically today, but they won the tie, yes. Really? God, the Champions League's boring when your own team's not in it. It's actually gotten worse, hasn't it? I was thinking about this last night because they're talking about this new format, which probably includes more sudden-death games, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. I actually kind of like the idea of it. It does include more teams, though. It's not, it, means you, it means you have to win 17 games as opposed to 13 to win the Champions League, which but you can only you can finish fifth in your league and make it. Yeah, that's well, and yeah. if you're in the fifth team in the Premier League, yeah, which yeah. is BS to be honest. Um, da, 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 uh, yeah, a former English rugby international. This is a bit of a strange one. Uh, Toby Flood played for England for quite a long time. Actually, quite a handy player. Wasn't that good in rugby 08 though? When I used to play that video game, didn't like Toby Flood. He was pretty useless. But in real life though, he was a good player. He is he's compared Scottish rugby winger. Um, Duan Van de Merver, it's a very South African name, to Jonah Lomu. Van de Merver stands at six foot four. He's uh, 106 kgs. He's 14 kgs lighter than Lomu. How tall was Jonah Lomu? Six, five, six five. I think he was something like that. Yeah. But uh, Toby Flood says that um, we've got a sort of a modern day version of him, which uh, you're not totally wrong. But I mean, Jonah was a unicorn. Jonah is Jonah, mate. Jonah Come Jonah. on. Yeah. Um. Some provincial rugby news. Uh, the 14 provincial rugby unions have landed global insurance company Gallagher, the sponsors of the English Premier League, uh, Premiership, excuse me, English Premiership, the rugby competition. They've landed Gallagher as a partner in a new commercial strategy that will deliver a greater autonomy from New Zealand rugby. So they're kind of distancing themselves a little bit from NZR, which is interesting. Uh, revenue will be split evenly across the 14 provinces. Auckland boss, the Auckland CEO that is very com uh, confident that more deals are on the way. The Auckland rugby chief executive's name is Jared Beer. Uh, he said uh, that the Gallagher deal wouldn't be the last under the new strategy with more partners in the pipeline. Well, good on you, uh, provincial unions. Great you're news. Yeah, you're finding Great ways news. to get money yourself. Yep. You're not Great sitting news. there waiting for NZR to sort themselves out. That's Listen to the women's game. Do the same. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah okay. do the same. Um, live sport on tonight. Uh, Australian NBL, as Marty referenced just before, uh, we've got Melbourne United up against the Illawarra Hawks. In the semi-final series, game one there. That's on at 9.30 today. Tomorrow, the Perth Wildcats and the Tasmania Jack Jumpers play in their opening game of their semi-final series. The two winners of these series play in the grand final series. And the NRL, I love Thursday night footy. I love it so much. It's just such a lovely little taste teaser for the weekend. I love it. Maybe not the most headline-y of matches that people would have wanted to see on a Thursday, the first Thursday of the year. But it's still got to be probably a good game. The Newcastle Knights up against the Canberra Raiders. That's in Newcastle. Kick off at 10pm. Now, this is a repeat of the qualifying final last year between these two that went to Golden Point. It was actually a half-decent game. Um, yeah, OK, for the time being, Martin, that's what's making you. Devlin. Yes! Yes! Can we do it? The Platform. Matt Elliott, big friend of the show. He joined us today. Coached the Warriors. Coached Penrith. Coached the Raiders. Over 400 first-class games as coach. And provided a really interesting insight. He turned 60 this year. Matt, you ever listen to him here where he talks about what he believes is the most important thing about coaching these days and how to embrace the young people, how to get inside their heads, how to impart the wisdom that he's got, but also to listen to what it is that is being said. When you look at coaching these days and your experience right now with what you're doing as well, how dramatically has it changed, even from the time a decade ago when you were coaching the Warriors? How much more work do you have to do? How much of more of a science is it? No, I think it's awareness at more than a science. So these are, and I can you know, put my hand up, this is probably what I got wrong at the Warriors. The most important thing as a coach is to understand the young people that you're working with. Now, you know, because you're further away from your birth certificate when we used to hang out. That's right. This is that young people are changing. 
And that's a good thing. People see it as, oh, you know, back in my day. I don't see it. It'd be as boring as, you know what, if everyone stayed the same all the time. So understanding how to communicate, how to engage, you know, how, how to make sure that these young people are learning from you with the amount of distractions that exist you know, in the modern world is the key thing to coaching. Because if you can be the smartest coach in the world, right, and know, know all the best strategy, but if you can't communicate with your players and make them understand and make them feel engaged and feel like they belong somewhere, it's, you, know, you might as well be speaking you know, whatever language you want to come up with. But it's just not, not good for them. And I think that was really evident to me for all the top teams. You can see that, right, with Nathan Cleary. Yeah, 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 for sure. Ivan Cleary. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can see that with Webster yes. as well. Yeah, you definitely. Know what I mean? you, yeah. you can see it after games. They're sitting in dressing rooms. He's not going up to players. Players are going up to him. You know, those little indicators. That's why Wayne Bennett is the best coach of all time. You know, and people can argue that about what Wayne knows about footy, but Wayne has really close relationships with his players. They listen to him. And, you know, that's, I think that's the key thing about coaching. So that you need to adapt, you know, and it's, it's not you need to become smarter. And that was, you know, what I, I lost my way there a little bit with that. It's not about becoming smarter. It's about learning how to adapt and, and how to communicate in the way that you need to, so that it's not the players adapting to you, you've got to adapt to the young people that exist in the world today. And that's not just confined to footy. That's every industry that has young people working in. I love hearing you saying that because we've got such a proliferation these days. There are so many people attached to a team. You're sports scientists, nutritionists, dietitians. You've got drones in the sky. You've got boffins on keyboards. But it's still a people business. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Well, all those people don't run out in the field. <laughs> so, and now we're human as well, right? And you know, we've met that smart person. I've been really smart, but I'd rather you know, get poked the eye with a burnt stick than hang out with them. It's, uh, it's the people that have wisdom to share with you that you really like being in their company. They're the people you learn off. They're the people that inspire you to do to do things and to be a certain way. And I, I think that, that that will always remain the foundation of coaching. Yes, how you use that new information, how you make that applicable to young people you know, and, and players, that's really important. Because that, that, that information now is so valuable. But you, it's not valuable if, you know, if they're not listening. Matt, how do we improve this game? Does it and, and, and does this comp, in fact, need improving? Well, I tell you what, one of the things we've already discussed is just get get those young people better. And I, now people talk about, oh, footy in my day, we were, oh, my goodness, that's just the biggest lie of all time. What some of these guys do on the paddock, guys and girls do on the paddock now, blows me away. The speed at which they play, the skill at which they play. I think our, you know, there's one thing our game we can, I can criticise them administratively for a lot of things that they've done, and you know we have the AFL here who are really well administered, and we're starting to catch up to them now. But what we've always done well as a sport is we've adapted the rules, adapted the rules to make sure that it remains a stick. Now, I, I can. And I'll say it with ease, rugby union hasn't done that. No, that's true. Particularly in Australia. You know, I don't need sleeping tablets. Just put rugby union on and I'm asleep. You know, and you know, I've seen rugby union played in New Zealand at the club level and God, that is so entertaining, but that's nothing like what I see at the elite level. Now, our, our, our administration has done a really good job with adapting rules to make sure that the speed of the game is something that entertains our fans and tests our players. And that's the key to it, you know, and rugby union, you know, and it's, it's easy to criticise and we sit on the side of the microphone and I criticise because I love the game. They talk about fan-centric and fan engagement and everything else and then you look at what the Up The Wars movement has done, which has just been grown by the fans, for the fans, because of the fans. And to me, it doesn't get better than that in any sport, isn't it? You give the game back to the people and guess what happens? Yeah, and 
Now, again, how good was that? Not just for rugby league in New Zealand. That was say that talent your audience to know this. That was good for rugby league right through our whole region. For everyone that watches from you know, I've just been up in PNG. You know, from from people that played the game up there, right through Australia, right through the South Pacific. You know, that that everyone was talking about it. Everyone was engaged in it. So that's the power of you know that that fan engagement can do. It's not just about that one club. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Got a brand new rugby league show, details of which I'll tell you about in just a couple of minutes. Quick comment on Spencer Leno. Just before we go to the break, and we'll talk some cricket with Bernie Cohen. Still no word for Mardo, so we'll try and squeeze him in tomorrow for you. Love having him on the show. It's normally live every Thursday. This is the platform, by the way. Spencer Leno. Now, the communications staff, the PR consultants, that department at the Roosters, there's a myriad of people that have those jobs. They are highly experienced. They are paid to exercise good judgment. I'm sitting here wondering, because if it was me in those jobs, this is what I would be doing. First and foremost, after that game, I would never have allowed Spencer Lenu to do an after-match interview. I would have had him out of bounds straight away because he just poured petrol all over himself and the incident by saying, oh, it's just fun and games on the field, bro, and all that kind of stuff. No, it's not fun and games, mate. You called somebody a monkey. This day and age, that is a racist insult. The other thing is, is why haven't they in the last 48 hours, because this is ongoing and going on, and the easiest way to put a full stop after the event, before it goes to the judiciary, would have been, and they could have filmed this in-house, is to have Spencer Leno in front of a camera, and all the guy's got to say is, listen, I'm sorry for what I said. In the heat of the moment, out there on the field, a word came out of my mouth, and I don't know where it came from, I don't think like that, Sometimes all of us do this in life. Sometimes you have an argument with your partner and you might say, F off or F you or something, and you feel like stink afterwards, right? We all do it, and we've all done it. And afterwards you feel like such an a-hole because you think, I don't mean that, love. I didn't mean to say that. I I said terrible things, and I don't mean to say that. And you kind of feel a bit of empathy for it, and you kind of feel a bit of forgiveness because we've all crossed that line when we haven't wanted to. We're talking about men in physical combat. We're talking about big men where we promote aggression in the game and we want confrontation. Now, Marcelo Montoya did something similar a couple of years back. And I heard him on the news yesterday saying, hey, look, I owned that. That's all I want to say about it. That wasn't me. I, you know, and, and I've met Marcelo and I've spoken to him a couple of times and I actually believe that guy. I totally believe that guy. I think that, okay, whatever happened in the heat of the moment to provoke him into it or because his blood rushed through his head or he just lost his cool or whatever it is, we are all allowed to make a mistake. And sticks and stones may may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, in this case, it does hurt because it's a racial insult. But if Spencer Leno had just got up front of the public and said, hey, listen, look, I'm a proud Samoan man and I've got a lot of love for Ezra and I I said something really stupid. I'm not trying to get out of it here. I'm I'm, I'm not trying to paper over it here. I'm happy to go to the judiciary. I'm not even going to contest this. I'm just, look, they'll give me a punishment. All I just want to say is I'm sorry and it's not actually me. That's not the person I am. And if he had done that, it would diffuse it, it would it would lower the, the temperature level, and it would probably actually work in his favour in terms of the punishment. Instead, he's been bullish, he's been aggressive, he's been arrogant about it, not a single bit of apology, and this story has continued to have legs. It just stuns me why no one at the Roosters has a brain and can engage that brain and the most simple piece of PR, a humble apology and some honesty. Courtesy of Microbio Solutions Limited, we got a brand new league show starting Monday. My name is Martin Devlin. And I'm Tony Kemp. And we're talking rugby league, mate. Mate, it's back, and it's back and better than it's ever been before because the old team's back, Marty. People don't know that. Me and you, that's how it got started. You're an apologist for the Warriors. You've always been an apologist for the Warriors. All you do is make excuses for the Warriors. Are you serious? Is that going to continue this year? Cut it out. Are you serious? I'm the only bloke, I think, that calls it as I see it. There won't be no apologies this year. They've got a big year ahead of them. They've got to make the top four. Every year, does this thing get better and bigger and faster and stronger? Best condition I've seen the players in in 2024. I don't know how big 
and how fast they can get from here. If you have a look at that young Brisbane Broncos side, I think they're the team to beat. In terms of the Warriors, who do you look at? Does Big Adam put the foot down and does he go as hard as he did last year? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Does he take the Cronulla money and run in round two, round three, or does he stay here for 26 rounds and get the job done, win a grand final with the Warriors? Part of me says he hasn't gone have the year that he had last year. Uh, part of me is hoping that he does. But let's forget about Adam Fanua Blake because the real man we're all looking at here is RTS. We need to see if Roger Tuivasa-Shek can be a Joey Manu, especially after the way Joey Manu hit the ground in Vegas. Vegas, baby! Las Vegas! Look, it's a big shiny gimmicky thing. I loved it. I, I don't know whether or not it's the future of rugby league, but I love the fact that it was on the big stage in the big town. That's right. Vegas is probably where they've been trying to get to. Remember in 87, they took the Origin game up there and it was a big flop. I think this time, Vegas, everyone wants to go up there. Do they take it to the Americas? Do they get it into the Asias? That's Volandi's big hope, and I'm looking forward to that space. It's going to be great to talk about as well. Rugby League, every single Monday, 3 to 4, and we look at the NRL. It's one of the greatest competitions in the world. This time of year does not get any better. I'll tell you what, and many of you have been waiting for us to get back. Devlin and Kemp, call it as it is. No holds barred. No punches, You're going to get it right no between the eyes. No PR stuff. That's right. If you want to hear it live, tune in Monday, 3 to 4, because Marty Devlin's back with Tony Kemp. Every Monday, ladies and gentlemen, we look back at the NRL round. We've got a special Up the Waz segment. He's a ledge and one of the greatest ever to play the NRL. Joining us on Monday, we want you on board to Fan Forum Corner where you'll be free to call up and start talking league a whole hour of it. And that is every Monday, three till four. Devian. Oh, my goodness me. The platform. All right, Martin, I've got breaking news. Go on. Big breaking news. Go on. And this is actually big breaking news. This isn't me just saying that I think the Broncos are going to win the premiership. Um, Spencer Lenu and the Sydney Roosters have entered a guilty plea to the charge against the prop relating to a racist comment made towards Brisbane Bronco Ezra Mann. Lenu expressed remorse for his comments towards Mann made during the NRL's opening round, uh, the first two game, couple, uh, the second game, excuse me, in Vegas last weekend. Uh, here is a direct quote. I want to apologise to Ezra and his family for using the word I did, and I am sincerely sorry to cause him such distress. I've put my hand up and want to take ownership of this. I said the word, but I didn't mean it in a racist way. Anyone who knows me knows that that's not who I am. Uh, Len Yu will face the NRL judiciary to learn his punishment on Tuesday. You said this at the Did start I of the say show. This at the start of the show. You said this is what he should do. Did I not say that if I was working for PR for the Roosters, I'd get him in front of a camera and I'd say exactly that. Yep. I'm not this guy. I something came out my mouth. I'm sorry for saying it. I ain't that person. I'll accept my punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I I applaud that. I applaud that. I, I applaud it. I um, that. But I would say, if I'm allowed to be critical. It is a few days too late. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But at the same time, he's done it now. He's done it now. He's he's done d- it. He ended up doing the right And thing. I hope you still get a couple of weeks because you deserve a couple of weeks. But anyway, well done. <laughs> Bernie Cohen, freelance cricket writer out of Australia. Makes a hell of a lot of docos as well. Great docos. Look them up all over YouTube. It's Cohen, C-O-E-N. Do we have a chance? Do we have a... Do we have a, I mean, it's Australia. Look what happened at the Basin Reserve. Is this going to be a repeat of that? Is it? Bernie, give me hope. How is tomorrow's test going to be any different from the Basin Reserve? Well, I think it might depend on who New Zealand pick. Um, for one thing, and how they bowl. I mean, I looked at that that first test, and there's... Look, I've said for a long time, I think when you're bowling to Steve Smith early on, he's, oh, obviously he works out his own problems very, very quickly, but I think there's a, a couple of things with the, the way they bowl to certain bats. I mean, the first innings they showed how you bowl with Travis Head early on. He played six deliveries, looked absolutely horrible in all of them. You get... And yet you bowl just outside his off stuff. Kawaji, you can't do that. Kawaji's like Mark Taylor used to play. I'd watch a match and he'd let a ball go and it missed the stumps by three centimetres. And I'd go, right, Mark Taylor's seeing the ball like a watermelon tonight. And Kawaji will do that. He'll, he'll just let, he's happy to let the ball go. And it doesn't frustrate him. Travis Head likes to play shots. Kawaji, you actually have to make him play it. They have to put the ball probably on middle and off. So it forces him to play it. Uh, and Smith, I just, I've always been the advocate of when he gets in early, you've got to bowling bounces. Not a lot of them, not bombarding them, but I think early on in his innings, he does have a problem with a bouncer. So, so did David Warner, and the only blokes that seemed to do <laughs> bowl, bowl the right way to them were the Englishmen. They were the only guys that seemed to bowl and have the right tactics. Again, bowling to the tail, 
there's this thing around the world now with teams wanting to bounce tailenders all the time, and I, I don't know it doesn't seem to work very often. We saw it when Australia played England in the Ashes, and the Aussies did it, and it just did not work. Um, so there's a few things there. I think Santa obviously will probably come in, depending on what the pitch is looking like over there. Um, I was surprised he didn't play in the first test. Um, but they said the wicket was very different to how it normally plays. But when you've got a frontline spinner who's as experienced as that um, and gives you some variation, because they ended up obviously having the ball Phillips, who was a bit of a revelation <laughs> with his off spin. Was, and obviously he hasn't played a lot of test cricket. So I wasn't familiar with his bowling with a red ball, but he was very impressive for a bloke that's regarded as a part-time off spinner. So, look, I think it depends on, you know, the way they bowl and, and who they pick. I think certainly Santa has to come in. Um, I think they're going to miss... The young bloke overall looked quite good. I think that's going to be a bit of a blow. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I think everyone was saying this before the summer started when we looked at all the test matches. We were going, that test series against New Zealand is going to be the best one. <laughs> and, and the first test was I admit, very disappointing because uh, I thought it would be a lot more competitive than it was. But... Let's hope this second one is a little bit more competitive. Yeah, look, we all thought that too. Um, and look, we, you know, we the media over here, we hype up, up this team so much. Uh, we exaggerate, you know, how how um, good the two victories were against a South African E or VF or, or you know or G side. Read the pitch wrong. I've got to tell you that a year ago, Jack Leach for England went to the base and got eight wickets in that test. So even though what traditionally it's meant to be a seamless wicket, you know, Nathan Lyon got enough out of it, as you say, Phillips got enough out of it. Do you know if you're if you're New Zealand is the only way to beat Australia that we actually have to bowl at them first, or is or is or is it maybe even time to actually rethink that? No, I, I don't think. I, look, if the wicket looks like it's going to do something on the first morning and do a lot, and the weather suits it, and you really think this is going to be a horribly bad wicket to bat on um, early on, I think you know you bowl. But I've always been an advocate of batting first. I just it leaves that it leaves that little question mark at the end of the test match. If you've got a bat last on the wicket, how it's going to play. And we always go when sides have a lot to chase. If they're chasing more than 250 or 300 and the wicket's turning a bit, you're going to struggle against Australia with Nathan Lyon polling. So I, I'm i not a great advocate of bowling first unless unless you're not confident your batsman can perform. Um, you know, I just think... I mean, and look, it could have turned out differently, you know, had they been able to get rid of Cam Green, who obviously was ridiculously good in that first test match uh, because, you know, the, the rest of the batting lineup. I mean, they had a reasonable start, but they you know, put on 60 for the first wicket. So it wasn't as though the Aussies had a horrible start either. But um, New Zealand went in and it looked horrible when they batted second. So you could wait up and look at the scorecard and go, well, maybe we should just bat first. But no, I would be I would be batting first, particularly if it looks like it's going to gonna take some spin. There is absolutely no way I would be wanting to bat last against Australia with Nathan Lyon there. And a bloke who's highly underrated as a spinner is Travis Head. Um, he's not the greatest spinner in the world, but he's a lot better than an average spinner. And I'd say that now looking at Phillips, the, the test match I've seen from him, I think he'll be, become a very, very important player in, in New Zealand cricket because I was quite staggered when you look back, he didn't bowl in the first innings. He comes out in the second, takes five foot. And he actually looked very good. <laughs> so... I think, yeah, but to, to answer that question, I, would, I wouldn't be bowling first unless this wicket looks like it's going to be a nightmare to battle. The Tight Five. Five separate sporting topics, roughly a minute or so on each. We get reminded to move on to the next topic when that goes. Knights Raiders, who wins tonight? We've talked about that a little briefly. I'll keep asking you, Lachlan. Second test starting tomorrow as far as the Black Caps are concerned. We have got much to celebrate with Southie and Kane Williamson, two superb stalwarts of New Zealand cricket. What a wonderful way to celebrate their ton up it would be if we could. The Aussie Women's Domestic Rugby Competition trophy has been unveiled, Lachlan. Best described, I think, is an <laughs> anatomical. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. It's on our Twitter. Uh, that's Martin Devlin in Z. Champions League. Are these the two finalists from this morning? Man City Rail. Joseph Parker fights on Saturday morning, eleven o'clock. That's kind of slipped a little bias that one. But bias that one. Um, I hope Joseph wins it. But I know nothing about the guy he's fighting. Ji Li Zhuang. Nothing at all. Uh, no ranking points for live golf players either. So what does this mean now? These two. Opposing factions, the PGA Tour and Liftgolf, seem just still miles apart. 
What does it mean for the majors is what I mean by that. Let's start with the second test starting tomorrow, mate. South K 100 tests each notching their places in New Zealand cricket history. Only four players have played 100 tests for New Zealand. Can you name them? Four? Yeah, clue. We spoke to one the other day. Ross Taylor? Yes. Jeez, oh, 100 tests. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they're all, Fleming? Yes. They're all modern players, mate. Oh, so I like played in the 21st century? Yeah, had to. Yeah, they've all they've all played That's in the last good points, yeah, um, ten or fifteen years. Don't, don't tell me. Are they all retired? Yep. Brendan oh, McCullum. Yes. That's through. That's two. So there's two others. Oh, no, geez. Taylor, Fleming, and McCullum. You got. You got. Oh, three. I've got three. Oh, there That's you go. Right. There's one, one more. more. One more. Bowler or better. Oh, Vittori. Yeah, Dan Vittori. So of course, it is a hell of a list to etch your name onto, isn't it? Um, you know, we have had some wonderful cricketers over the years. You know, the Hadleys, the Crows, uh, you go back to the Donnellys, you go back to... Um, well, I, I mean, I, I grew up with those 80s guys. I mean, I, I loved all of those guys, but, you know, you go back further than that and you think none of them were ever in a position to play 100 tests because, you know, it's it's only now modern-day cricket where we don't actually play that many. We only play seven, eight, nine a year, despite what the CEO, David White, told us, that they're playing 14 a year. It's untrue. We play on average about seven or eight. So you're going to have to play... For the That's best right. part of 13 or 14 years, right? Mm. So to do that, it's, an, it's, it's such a testament to longevity and to consistency. Kane has got 38, 32 test centuries. Southie's got 378 wickets. Uh, there's only 17 bowlers who've got 400 wickets. So I wonder whether he's hanging on to see whether he can actually etch out another 22. It'd be bloody good if he grabbed a five at starting tomorrow. So, congratulations to both of them. I just wanted to separate that from talking about the test. Now, we've already discussed this. What chance we got? Percentage chance? Oh, shall I get out? Get on. The get Google it. live win probability. I would say at a guess we're 18 or lower. 18% or lower before it all kicks off. Let me check the forecast as well, mate. No, we're not that bad. We're 25%. Okay, Australia 63 Twelve percent of a draw. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the percentage chance I give us, uh, I give us a, a nice cool seventeen percent. Okay, five day forecast. This is your God. Your, your site is useless, Met Service. It really is. Why don't you just put up something clear that says this is what it's looking like in Christchurch for the next five days? <laughs> there is a tab that says seven day forecast. Is there where? Show me where it is. Okay. Matt. Well, for, for starters, you're a six year old man on a computer, so you obviously are struggling. Where's the tab? Next seven days. There it is. Okay. God, oh, make man. it easy. Yes, no. Okay, we've it actually is got, easy. We've actually got fine weather all the way through till Tuesday. So that's the first five days of the test match. So it doesn't look as though that is going to save us. Percentage chance of winning? Google says twenty-five. I'd say that's generous. Yeah, I would it's say. generous for the Absolutely. black Absolutely, I did. Champions League. Man City cruised at 6-2 on aggregate today. Rail battle. They got a one-all draw at home. We'll talk to Miles about this uh, in half an hour. So, a uh, 2-1 aggregate win for them. Are these the two finalists? Providing they can avoid each other, obviously. I mean, that goes without question. Are these the two finalists, do you think? Are these the two best teams? Uh, yeah. Probably. Uh, the next, the third best, I mean, I don't, I'm not putting Bayern Munich in there because they have been, um, by their own standards, a train wreck in all competitions this season. Uh, I wonder if they're absolutely punting the Bundesliga now, though, because they're 10 points off by Leverkusen who haven't lost a game in that comp so maybe they're, all their energy is just and because and Thomas Tuchel is out at the end of this year so he's probably going to want to get as much silverware as he can which is only one competition that they're in because they're not winning Bundesliga which is the Champions League so maybe Bayern Munich will go hard at the Champions League uh, but apart from them Inter Milan because they're running away with Serie A so they're a half decent team at the moment Arsenal I don't think they will because this is the first time they're in the Champions League in like five years isn't it they'll be concentrating on the title mate. Yeah, and, yeah I think they will be concentrating on the title um, and they're not going to beat Man City across two leagues um, or even if there's a one off final so no Real are the second best team now assuming that they don't get drawn against City because mm-hmm. it's a, I think I think apart from the semis or the quarters one of the two it's not randomised but assuming they don't get drawn against Man City um, that should be the final yeah I think it will be the final couple of text messages. We've had so many uh, people saying, hey, look, bloody brilliant, lads. Uh, awesome news on the new league, league segment. Looking forward to it. Oh, thank you so much. Three to four it is on Mondays. Uh, Matt says, on another radio station this morning, is he dag reckon Stead is dead man walking? Matt, I'll tell you what, I'd be surprised at that only because, you know, I think Gary Stead's track record is better than everyone else that has coached the team. Yeah. I think he's going to be given the grace to, to decide when he wants to go. And remember, he's cut back on his, his commitment as well. He, so he, he's, he's actually got other guys in place here. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that Israel's wrong. I mean, he, he might have bloody good oil. But 
Um, and thank you for listening to us in the afternoon and changing radio stations, my friend. I'm very, I'm delighted with that. Um, J.R. Reid, Stu Dempster, Bert Sutcliffe, Turner Tales, uh, great players and have all missed out on a ton. Yeah, thank you, for Mike, for that as well. Yeah, I, I, was, I was struggling with J.R. Reid. That was the guy that I was trying to remember, but thank you for reminding me. Joseph Parker, 11 o'clock Saturday, Ji Ling Zhang. I'm not even going to try and pretend I know who this guy is. I've, I've read a bit about it, and he's a tricky opponent, they say, and he's this and that. But I also think that Joseph has selected this. He's the undercard for Joshua versus Francis. Yeah. Isn't he the MMA guy? The yeah, M- yeah, but he's actually had a pretty good transition into okay, boxing. Okay. He, cause he fought Tyson Fury not long ago, and I think Fury won. I think it was a split decision. Yeah, that's right. You're right. You are. Yeah, that's and right. And it was very a very contentious result. Many right. people didn't think it, w- it okay. should have gone that way. I think that this uh, opponent's been handpicked for Joseph because of his brilliant win. His brilliant win against Deontay Wilder. Mm. And I don't think that his management would want anyone in that ring with him that has a potential chance of beating him. Because Joseph has got that little pot simmering over here, hasn't he? I beat Wilder, therefore I can actually get a really big fight next. Yeah, I'm not going to get knocked out by my next opponent or beaten on points by the next opponent. So without even knowing anything about his opponent, I think Joseph wins this fight. Yeah, I think this How's is that a, for the dumbest I think, sporting argument we've ever Yeah, I think, well, I think this is essentially it's a training run for his next biggish yeah. belt, yeah. which is what? Who's it going to be against? Because he... Because Usyk and Fury are set to fight. Become, that fight's been postponed, isn't it? But that's set to be... That's the best of the best. So, the, so who's Joseph up against next? Would he be... The guy next off the ranks to face Joshua, I'm maybe? I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm, so if yeah, he wins this and Joshua might, wins, do they yeah. then fight each other well, he again? Might be, he might be one behind that person, but he's pretty bloody close now. Uh, Kurt Eklund is going to join us in a minute. Mm-hmm. The Australian Women's Rugby Trophy has been unveiled. Look, it's a beautiful, shiny trophy. It's all done in Aboriginal style. What does it look like? It looks like a vagina is what it yep. looks like, yep. Lachlan. Yep. And I don't know how else you can describe it. I said anatomical. I was just being polite. Look at it. It's on our Twitter, <laughs> Martin Devon NZ. It is what it is. It's 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 that. You tell me it's not, okay? Have a look at that trophy and tell me it's not. The, tell me that's not the first thing that you thought of when you saw that. My God, that's a that's a it's a girl's bits, bloody girl's bits thing. The platform. The Blues are top of Super Rugby. Two out of two. They beat the Andrua in Whangarei. They beat the Highlanders in the Melbourne round. Kurt Eklund, hooker. For the team this weekend, away the Hurricanes. He joined us today. Well, how's it all going for you lot? Two and O is a good way to start the season, isn't it? You'll be pleased with that. Yeah, mate, you can't complain. Um, you know, obviously we wanted to get off to a good start and two wins on the well, well, one of them was a home game, but it didn't really feel like it. That's right. Um, and the other one in Melbourne. So no, you can, um, we're happy with where we're at. Yeah, that's an away game. Probably didn't feel like it either, because yeah, a bit different yeah, from playing. It was like. Yeah, 28 degrees up in Whangarei, and I, I swear more, there were more Fijian supporters there than there were Blues, but um, made for a pretty cool spectacle, mate, and it was a good way to kick the season off. You've played, you know, pretty good razzle-dazzle rugby at the moment, but what is the coach saying to you? What's Vern saying to you? He wouldn't have been happy conceding 29 points against the Highlanders, right? No, exactly, man. That's something that we need to um, clean up a little bit. You know, we've um, leaked a few tries in both games. So it's quite a big focus for us, um, the, uh, well, this week especially, because we know what the Canes can bring. But, um, you know, on the other side of that, the boys are scoring some pretty nice tries. And, um, you know, we just got to keep going in with an attacking mindset and not really try and um, play with the defending, what do you call it? We, we don't want to go out there and defend the game. We want to go out there and win it. And we want to play a good brand of rugby. So that's what we um, aim to do. Traditional blues rugby, I'd call that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, mate get the ball up. I think we've got a big um, emphasis on collisions this year. It wants us to be a lot more physical than what we have been previously. And, um, you know, I think if we can win that aspect of the game, then we'll be away laughing. I was going to say, I have one of the things I'd written down, and it's great you mentioned that because I've actually noticed that. And I've also thought that set piece-wise, you've been pretty consistent as well. And that's really important for somebody like you playing where you play. Yeah, the boys, um, you know, they I think they hit 100% lineouts last week, mate. So that's something that we're to take on moving into the um, rest of the season and our scrum's going alright too you know we've um, put a bit of work into that over the pre-season and uh, I think you know we've we've come leaps and bounds and hopefully you know things just keep moving in the right direction Kurt when you when you start the season you have a couple of warm up games and you know a lot of guys get sort of a few minutes here and a few minutes there what kind of step up is it really then when you play your first competition games do you really notice it in the first couple of weeks 
I think like the intensity is definitely a lot more. You know, you play your preseason games and everybody's getting a run from both sides of the team and all that sort of stuff. And you know, the the scoreline isn't like it doesn't really matter that much. But you know, once you're in the competition, mate, that you know, there's a bit more pressure. We go to win. Um, I think it's that aspect of the games that it def- definitely brings the intensity. Um, obviously, you know, there's points up for grabs and things like that. So um, once you, you know, once the season really kicks off properly, mate, you definitely f- uh, notice a difference. But is all the training there? Does it prepare for the lung burn? Do you really notice that? Like the first couple of games, you go, God, I tell you what, she's a little bit faster than I thought it would be. Oh, uh, bro, honestly, you can't. I don't think there's anything that can replace match fitness. You know, you can do as much running as you want. You can hit as many tackle bags, but once you're out on that field, mate, it's something different, you know. Repeated efforts and having to hit a ruck then to make a tackle and be on side all the time, mate, she's, she's a bit of a tough one. Look, that, I don't know, when you're in the Melbourne round, do you actually get to sit and watch even a few minutes of some of the other games, or you're just sort of cocooned in what you're doing yourselves? Um, I think, well, last week I was running waters, mate, so you know, the, the pressure wasn't on me as much. So, yeah, I got to have a little bit of a look to see what the other boys were doing. But, but most of the guys, you know, you go away on these trips and things like that and everyone thinks it's pretty nice because you get to do a bit of travel. But the reality is, you know, you get there, you got your captains one day and you're back in the hotel and you play your game and you leave. Well, we um, left the hotel at 6 o'clock the next morning. So there's not too much, like, downtime around it and you're pretty focused when you're there. And I think, you know, as professional... Yes, we that's our job, mate. We go over there, we want to get the job done and then just get home to so move on to the next one. So um for the boys who are playing it's definitely it's not it's not a holiday at all, you know. We're in there and yeah, we wanna get, get get something out of it. Um in terms of the suspensions and that with Geordie's one especially, I don't know whether you saw that. If you're watching the game you would have seen it. No malice you know, no 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 malicious intent or anything like that. And it. it's just the rules. It obviously is still taken, even for the very best players who play at the highest levels and that some adjustment. How much work do you actually do on that during the week? Is it a real focus that your coach is saying to you just gotta come down this low, gotta come down? Yeah, it's tough man. Um, you know, obviously they're um they're kind of much stricter with these rulings and things like that. So it is something that we do focus on. Obviously tackle height is very important. And that goes for both players, not just the person getting tackled, but the um, tackler as well. You've seen like head on heads mm. and um, some bad concussions like that. So it is definitely something that we focus focus on. And I think like, you know, player welfare um, is definitely front of mind when we're doing it. Are you wearing that mouth guard? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the boys are wearing the mouth guard. And again, you know, it's um, player, player welfare, I suppose. Um you know, I think they take a little bit of getting used to, but you know, at the end of the day, they're all just out there to protect us, I suppose. Um, I, I hear there's some pretty mixed reviews about them, but, mate, our job is just to go out there and play rugby, and if that's what we've got to do to do it, then so be it. Kurt Eklund is with us. Yeah, Hurricanes away, mate. Never an easy game. Good local derby, this one, too. Um, in terms of the physical stuff, they're going to bring it. They always do. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, they've got some big boys and some big ball carriers there. So, you know, like you said, it's a local derby and, um, you know, one that we always look forward to playing and I'm sure um, they do as well. So it makes for a pretty good spectacle. And, um, you yeah, know, so hopefully, well, they have uh, two wins mm. um, as mm. well. So, you know, um, one of us are going to come away with a loss and I hope it's not us. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Introducing Finn Sermon, central defender for the Wellington Phoenix. He's been playing out of his brain over the last few games. Absolutely rock solid in defence. He's got a great pedigree, great history. 15-year-old left Christchurch to go to the academy uh, he played for the New Zealand under-20s at the FIFA World Cup and from there got selected for the All-Whites. His team sits in the number one spot in the A-League with six games to go. He joined us today. 11 wins and only Central Coast Mariners can match that. How do you approach the next six games being in the position you are? And you know, and whenever we've had anyone on from the Phoenix, I've said, look, the table doesn't lie. You deserve to be top because you've won the most games and accumulated the most points. Yeah, I, I agree with what they, those boys have said, and and it, it, it's true. We deserve to be deserve to be where we are because of the performances that we've that we've put out. Um, in terms of the next the next six seven games, it's it's literally 
what we've been doing from the start, to be honest. Like, we're just taking it game by game, you know, focus this week on Melbourne City away in Melbourne, which will be a really tough fixture, and then hopefully um, get the get the three points there and get a good result, and then and then we'll focus on the next week. But it's been pretty similar throughout the entire season. We're just we're just taking it each week at a time, one game at a time, and it seems to be working so far. And is that the message that Chiefy gives you as well? When it's done and dusted, that's the result from last week. We just look at this game. I mean, it's, look, I know that a lot of people say, hey, it, it's a cliche. It's a cliche for a reason, because if you keep your mind just focused on one task, does it make it a lot easier? Yeah, you're, you're 100% right. It does It does sound like a cliche, and 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 that's because it, it gets brought up all the time, but like, that's literally what we're doing is we take it game by game. We'll always we'll always review the, the previous game and see what we had done well and see what we could do better but then as soon as that's as soon as that's done the, the focus switches completely to just our next game and how can we get the best result for us how do you walk off the field mate when it's three two you've got to win you've got three points do you sit there and you defenders go bugger we conceded two goals how does that work yeah i think it, it would depend on it would depend on how we how we conceded the goals you know we weren't we weren't very happy with how we we conceded you know if you concede two bombs then sometimes you think oh you sit back and think there's not much we could do about it but a couple of those goals that that we reviewed we we thought we should have done a bit better I mean at the end of the day the most important thing is the win and and the team got us over the line there and of course as a defence we'd love to keep keep more clean sheets which we've been doing well at this season but look at it we look at the goals and, and think how can we do it better and then just maintain the focus for the next game really and try to fluff out those errors the Breakers had a great away record last year and they coined a phrase called Road Warriors. They loved going away from home. I know you guys enjoy such great support at home. You could hear the rowdiness in the back of that commentary there from Jace. Um, mm. Going on the road, do, is, there, is there anything different and special that you do as a team when you go on the road? Um, I think there, there probably is a little bit. It is a little bit different. You know, when we're at home, we we have the fans behind us and we, we, we don't have to have to travel which is which is quite a big factor in the in the A League. You know, travelling over to Australia it does it does take its toll. It's not something that you can really get used to. Um, you can feel you can feel as ready as possible but your body's not gonna be hundred percent used to it, um, flying the day before the game. So it's it's really up to the coach how he sets us up, right? But we definitely take the approach that we want to win the game and but then at the at the same time like any result is a good result away from home. Finn Sermon is with us. Uh, you got uh, called up to the All Whites after a, a fantastic Under-20 World Cup last year. Congratulations again. What an honour for that. And, I, and you know, I hope you've got a massive future for our national team in front of you. How, how goddamn exciting is it, thinking about that? Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting. You know, it's, it's one of those things that the national team's always in the, in the back of my mind. Like, I want to, uh, having represented New Zealand before at the, the Under-20s and then getting my All Whites call up, it was... There were major moments within my life, um, and it's something that I want to have. I want to have more of, um, and I know the best way to do that is by performing at my club and continuing to do well with the Phoenix, and, and then hopefully I get the call, call up in the future. Back with Jason Costigan, we are Costo's Corner, where our man runs through game by game, sticks the big chin out tonight. It all kicks off, mate. Knights versus Raiders. Who you got? Well, a lot of people are basically death riding the Canberra Raiders. Yeah, I'll, I'll build yeah. on what I said, on what, on what I alluded to last week in, in our discussion. Canberra Raiders are friendless in betting. Newcastle, I, I would have thought, starting at home, uh, first game, I'm tipping Newcastle comfortably. Uh, and if it's a blowout in round one, in, as they deal with life after after Whiten. Don't forget, he's their gun player. He left the club, and Jamal Fogarty, uh, or Fogarty has the responsibility now to steer the ship. Uh, it, it could be a long season for Canberra, and I think Newcastle will win this handsomely, 13-plus. Was at home, Sharks. Uh, I can't see the Warriors losing this game. I just think that man for man, they're better. Um, and, and you know, you, obviously you can't gauge anything, Jason, on, on pre-season form or anything, but I just get the no. feeling they're going to hit the ground running, mate. I, 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 I think this is a win for the Warriors. I'm not I, Probably unders because sh- the Sharks are a battling side. Well, the Sharks are better than a battling side. I'll beg to differ there. That They can get into a scrap and, 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 and will accommodate you or anyone who will take them on. And, and if they need to play an expansive game, 
then Nico Hines and others, uh, he's got a reasonable support cast. If they click, they can they can turn it on. I think this game will be closer than what people would like. If you're a Warrior supporter, I think it could be in the balance for a long time, this game. But I'm confident that the Warriors can start at home on a winning note, and I'm tipping the hosts 1-12. to 12. We agree on that. And then, what a blockbuster of a game to have afterwards. Friday night, NRL, they get it right. Waz versus Sharks is going to have a huge crowd. They know that. And then you back it up with the Storm versus the Panthers, which is 10 o'clock, 05, kickoff in New Zealand. But the, it's, it's the money game in Australia. It's the 8 o'clock game. And it's two of the teams that, over the last few years, everyone looks to and thinks, if you can get above them on the points table, Jace, well, you're going to be in the money, aren't you? Well, that's exactly right. And, and I've been tossing and turning on this game because read what you like into that World Club Challenge, the trip to England, going over there, dusting off cobwebs. Look, Melbourne will probably think, this is not a bad time to get them early in the season. So, you know, you're going to put me on the spot here. I'm not going to get splinters by sitting on the fence. Uh, I changed my mind on this a couple of times. Uh, Look, I'd like to see the teams right now tip before kickoff because that's how close this game. I think it'll be an amazing game of football. And uh, to, to sum it up, I'm probably going to tip the Storm 1 to 12. Ooh, Panthers lost their opener last year. I think they lost two out of the first three too, Jason, but it didn't stop them, did it? Pulling it no, back it and didn't. To the and, final, and yeah. they, don't hand, they don't hand out the trophy in March. No. Everyone's, un, you know what I mean? Aside from uh, uh, putting last week in Vegas into perspective, you know, going into round one, everyone's undefeated. So I know it's a, a, not your traditional round one because of it's, it's being spread out over two weekends, but... You know, as I said, Penrith, look, Penrith always come prepared. When did you last time, when was the last time you saw Penrith get flogged? No. You know, they're always well, they're always well presented. Uh, Cleary uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is one of the, you know, he's been compared to Bellamy. That's not lost on Bellamy. I'm sure Bellamy would like to beat him. Don't forget Bellamy is going to finish up at the end of this season. And there's a lot of people out there who, who are very romantic in the game. And that would include me who would say there's a possible Cinderella story there come come October. Eels versus Bulldogs. Jason Costigan with us at Costo Jace, the man's Twitter handle, and we love having him on every single Thursday, picking it from Thursday night match through. I'm going dogs here, and I don't know whether this is an an upset. Maybe my my, my, mate, uh, let's be positive, Matt Gunn's got in my ear too much about this, but at some stage this Bulldog side has got to correct itself. I'm going for the away win. Well, the dogs in recent years have been more like chihuahuas. <laughs> you know, let's let, let's not kid, our, no, not know, kid ourselves. No, I know, mate. I'm talking and, about and, you. And, 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 and if you lost your dog and you went to <laughs> Belmore to pick it up, you wouldn't find it because they keep going through dogs. Like, unless you've got them registered with the local council, you're going to have you're gonna have back, more issues mate. than your He's local council. He's here every Thursday, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, this is just the opening set. Can I? I'll sum up. I'll sum up by saying, Parramatta were underachievers last year. Yeah, they were. Big time, big time. They missed the finals. And you talk about a correction for Canterbury. I'm expecting a correction for Parramatta because if they don't start well, I think the knives may be out for Brad Arthur at some point. Uh, you mean, he's been there for a long time now and and I'm expecting bigger things from Parramatta this year. So they need to start well. And they missed the finals just albeit last year. And it's a massive game. These clubs absolutely despise one another forget about the the merry-go-round of players changing jerseys like we change our underpants it's not like the old days where you played out your career at the one club ask terry lamb and steve mortimer what i'm talking about but you know Sereldo's team looks nothing like the team from two years ago i'm tipping Parramatta one to twelve and i would expect it'll be a physical tough battle you've gone home 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 so far and i don't think you're changing your mind titans over dragons no, I'm not. You know, who's tipping St. George Illawarra? No one. You're tipping the Dragons. You should you should go and get your head read. Uh, like, they they are deserved favourites for the wooden spoon in my eyes. You mean, uh, Flanagan's got an, uh, an unenviable task to try and rebuild St. George Illawarra. So uh, uh, their, their opposition this week. Uh, with the change in coaching, uh, so uh, it's it's a, a new start for what Gold Coast is it not? Titans, Dragons, pal. 
So, yeah, so Gold Coast for mine. I think uh, Des Hasler will be uh, off to a winning start. I think they'll win very well, 13-plus. And it's a local derby, yes, because it's Queensland. Dolphins just down the coast from Brisbane, of course, or not. And they're actually outside the coast, I've got to say, uh, in Redcliffe there. Cowboys, who, again, are looking for a season to match the one they had the previous season to last, if you know what I mean. They were a bit disappointing last year, weren't they? They came very close. How do you see this one? Well, the Dolphins have a better roster by virtue of the fact that they've picked up players like Flegler and Farnworth, but I, I, I'm going to be leaning towards the Cowboys here. Uh, I'm going to tip Cowboys 1-12. to 12. Uh, there's, there's every expectation that North Queensland uh, will bounce back from what was a disappointing 2023 campaign. And uh, I said on your program, what, last week, if memory serves me right, that it wouldn't surprise me to see Tamalolo come out and almost eat players this season. He's hungry. He's really hungry, and he'll be fired up because he's had the captaincy taken away. Imagine you and I as little boys having our Tonka trucks taken away. That's Tamalolo. That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, 1 to 4, Monday to Friday, Download the Platform app and via Platform Plus you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do though is download the Platform app. Devlin. You better believe it. The Platform.